Hi there, and welcome to Axel Bank Reports History and Today conversations with America's top nonfiction authors and why their books matter right now. I'm Evan Axelbank, and today we're going to speak with Julia Cook, the author of Come Fly the World, the Jet Age Story of the Women of Pan Am. This is her second book. She's a prolific writer, though, having been published in Condé Nast, The New York Times, Playboy, and The Village Voice, a diverse array of publications there. Thanks so much for being here, Ms. Cook. Thank you, Evan. Before we start our interview, I do want to invite listeners to our Patreon page to ask for your support in keeping the show going. Go to patreon.com slash History. We're going to donate part of your contributions to a charity for children's literacy. So when it comes to flying, the thing everyone says about flying in this day and age, even pre-pandemic, is that it's just the worst. You're crammed in, you wait, you have no food, you have a drink the size of a thimble, you're delayed all the time. There are layovers in Chicago when you're going from New York to Tampa. Not that that happened to me. Oh, wait, yes, it did. Um, it's all just a mess. And then someone goes, remember how flying used to be? And we conjure up these images of meals, of space around us, of direct flights, and maybe some of us of friendly, usually female flight attendants who are there to handle every need that you might have. So before we talk about the specific women of your book and about Pan Am Airways, is that true? Is that how flying used to be? Uh, To some extent, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, people forget that back then, a cross-country flight would be around $500 in 1960 dollars. So imagine the cost of that today. Um, Flying was not a cheap proposition. Um, It was something that was not undertaken lightly or frequently. It was a a once in a, you know, once in a lifetime for a lot of people. So part of the changes that you're talking about and the kind of degradation of the glamour of it um, has to do, it's a a trade-off for the the really accessible um, air travel that we have today. I remember growing up in New York and the Pan Am building was something my parents would mention and I'd see it, you know, you can see it because it's, it straddles a whole avenue. So we would look down and we would see the Pan Am building and I'd go, wow, that's a neat building. How cool that is. And you'd see the letters up at the top. Um, And suddenly then it became, I guess, MetLife when I was seven or eight years old. But um, so what made you decide to study Pan Am? Uh, What image did Pan Am project and what did it represent not only to but also about America. Um, Why not other airlines of the day? Um, What made you think of Pan Am? Why Pan Am? Well, so side note about that building. Um, That building was the big, at at some point, it was the biggest corporate office tower in the world. It was designed by the Bauhaus founder, Walter Gropius, and it was also the last building... um, that was allowed to to put its logo up that high and that big, 15 foot letters in New York. Because after that, after that logo was put up, um, the the skyline was deemed, you know, protected. Um, Mm -hmm. So, so what you, the memory that you're mentioning, like the the sense of um, domination of Pan Am over this kind of, this, this industry as a whole is part of what drew me to write about Pan Am. Um, Pan Am was, uh, whenever you got on a Pan Am plane, you knew you were stepping off the plane in a foreign country because it was the country's only exclusively international airline. It only had the rights to fly internationally. Whereas TWA, Braniff, National, United, Delta, all of these other airlines had, um, they, they flew primarily domestic routes. And some of them had the right to fly to specific regions. So for example, Braniff flew to South America, um, but Pan Am was the only airline that only flew internationally. And it flew everywhere. Um, on a technical level, Pan Am was an airline of firsts. It was the first airline to um, fly across the Pacific. It was the first airline to have commercial routes that went all around the globe. Um, so. And, and a lot of these routes were um, created via the U.S. government. Um, Pan Am was intricately um, involved with the, gov- with the U.S. government, whether it was via um, wars and combat. So, for example, Pan Am uh, handled, uh, was very involved in World War II, which is 
talked about in detail in the book. Um, and that was how they, they connected the, um, the last segment of the global chain that they had, the global, um, the, the around the world flights in Africa. Those airstrips and those, those flight patterns were actually paid for by the US government uh, via the Lend-Lease Act um, for World War II. So for me, what I was mostly interested in was um, this sense of, of duality and the sense of global diplomacy that the women of Pan Am had to, um, had to embody. That they all had to be um, women who were really glamorous. We talk about the glamour and the, um, the, the luxury of the old days of airline travel. And yet in reality, these were women who were flying into and out of war zones. They were flying around, um, they were flying in dangerous circumstances. So I was really interested in, in learning about that duality. And one thing that you do talk about a lot in the book is how they become to represent the airline itself. They become the public face of the airline. And I do want to talk about that. But um, I want to talk a little bit more about the growth of Pan Am, because as you just said, it was subsidized by the government, yet the United States didn't want, um, as you put it, a national airline. So explain that duality or that dynamic as to why they would, why the government would say, we're going to pay for this airline to go around the world, but also not be our official national airline. Yeah, most other countries have something that they call a flag carrier. So that's an airline that, um, that the government kind of charges with uh, representing it elsewhere. Um, and it's what the government uses for its diplomatic flights. Um, the U.S. doesn't have that. We have a free marketplace. So we have these different, this uh, whole jumble of airlines that are all competing with each other. And this was true back then, as it's true now. Um, but Pan Am, in part because of the relationships of its founder, Juan Tripp, with um, men in high echelons of power, and in part because of its um, technical pioneering, uh, Pan Am always had a really close relationship with the U.S. government. So um, back in the 20s and 30s, this was, uh, it, it had a lot of uh, postal service contracts. And then when global war, you know, happened in World War II, um, Pan Am was charged with making these airstrips in Africa because uh, Europe was really afraid that the Nazis were going to launch um, a, a campaign across the uh, across the ocean from Brazil. Only a, a startlingly small amount of miles separates um, Brazil from Africa, which then can lead straight to Europe. So, um, so Churchill wanted these, uh, the airstrips, their air, airports and defenses in Africa to be fortified. And he asked um, Roosevelt to help with that. When we say jet age, um, before we get into some of the beef of the book here, what are we referring to? What time period are we referring to? The, the, the subtitle is the jet age story of the women of Pan Am. Um, so um, these days feel like the jet age to me at least because we get on the plane we get on the plane and it's smooth and for the i mean you know maybe uh, maybe once a month there's an incident of note and these are never deadly incidents thank goodness on an on an american airplane um you get on the flight goes 35,000 feet you barely feel a bump as long as the weather's okay you come down you land and it feels nice and good it feels very jet age at least to me um, what was flying like back in the 60s and 70s when most of your book takes place? Um, what was it like? How did it feel? Um, would we feel comfortable um, with our modern planes being on their planes back then? Honestly, I certainly would. Um, the fact <laughs> is that <laughs> the, the fact is that the, the jet age refers to uh, the period of time when um, airplanes switched from being propeller planes uh, to being pro using jet propulsion, right? So that actually, that started in 1958. But the jet age kind of more broadly to us means um, an era when of, of much faster travel. So what that means uh, realistically is a, a higher level of um, global interpenetration and just movement across borders. Uh, it was much speedier. Um, what I had not known and what, there, there's a wonderful book called Glamour by Virginia Postrel, which talks about um, all of the, the, the difference between like uh, glamour and other uh, modes of visual persuasion. Um, it, she goes really into depth about um, the way, the, the reasons why internationalism in the late 50s and early 60s was such a glamorous thing. And some of it was just um, because of, you know, the, the, the post-war stability 
was boring. Um, the same reason, the same thing that Mad Men kind of looks into, the, the ennui of that era um, and that, that level of stability. Internationalism provided this really potent, visually appealing, um, exciting counterpoint to that. So that's kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about the jet age. On the one hand, it's a technical thing, but on the other hand, it's, it's an aura. Before we get into the beef of, of the book here, um, I want to ask about your sources, because um, I was curious the entire time um, that I was reading it. Was this mostly a newspaper-based book and research effort? Um, are there records in public archives of Pan Am and how it worked? And it also, it seems to me like you also did some interviews for the book too. So just tell us a little bit about the sources and how this all came together, the research did in book form. So there are archives. They're at the University of Miami um, and they're incredibly in-depth. It, it's, it's all of Pan Am's corporate um, communications and, and records went to the University of Miami. How did they wind up there? That's interesting. Uh, Pan Am started in Miami. And yeah, but but did they have to submit them or was there an effort to say, um, we want to make sure the story of our company is told one day in books like yours? Yeah, I, I think it's the latter. Um, I, and I don't have that on the record at all, but my impression is very much that that's, that's, that's the intent. Um, Pan Am is an important part of American history. Um, I would argue more so than other airlines uh, because of those technical firsts. Um, and because of its inter, uh, it, its strong relationships with the U.S. government, so um, there are a lot of different pockets of history, and there are a lot, there are a lot of books that should be written about um, the airline and about the jet age in in, in general. Uh, so it's important for those archives to you know, exist, um, and they're stewarded by an incredible team of archivists down at the University of Miami, um, who are wonderful. So so, yeah, so you had the archives at Miami. So I had how the else did you put that together? Yeah. Yeah. So so basically, my approach was really to let the oral history um, guide the the archival or secondary source research. Um, I was really, you know, I'm my background is in journalism and in reporting, not in historical um, research. Even though I, I have done a fair amount of that, um, what really interested me first about these women and the topic in general was meeting the women themselves. So I felt strongly that I wanted. Um, the, the feeling of being with the women to be what drove the book. Um, I wanted it to be character driven. I wanted it to be about their experience of history rather than how history um, was impacting them in a way. So I, I, my, my approach to the research was to toggle between um, talking a ton to a bunch of different women, uh, doing really in-depth interviews, um, and then going to the archives to, uh, to get information on what they had told me about or looking at newspapers. So for example, there's an incident um, in the book that's in which Tori Werner is um, a part of a diplomatic kidnapping, right? Um, she's kind of in, caught in the, in the crossfire in a way. Um, and she had told me about this. And I remember the first time I, I heard about this, it was an incident that happened in 1966. It was her fourth month of flying. Um, and I was, I was floored. I was shocked and I was like this can't possibly have happened the way she told me that it happened this is bonkers um and I went to the you know so I, I started with the New York Times archives and I found out that in fact it had happened and then I um looked at a couple of diplomatic world history books and then I found a couple of a, a cable in the um Pan Am archives and some declassified government documents that also referred to this in this incident. So from that, then I went back to Tori and said, okay, here's what I found out. Do you remember this aspect of it? If not, what do you remember about this? What did this feel like? So, um, and then I would just kind of go back and forth between interviews and then looking at f finding um, verification. What did being a flight attendant promise to the women who signed up? And it was mostly women, correct? I mean, overwhelming majority. Can you give, is there a percentage? I mean, is it 99%? Is it 90%? Um, so, so what did being a flight attendant promise to these women? And, um, and it was mostly women, right? At some point it was almost, a, it was a hundred percent women yeah. um, in the late sixties. So basically it started, uh, it started out as men um, because planes were following the model, the established model of train stewards. So um, men were, were flying the first flights in the late 20s. Um, and then a woman uh, went <laughs> on, it, it, at, in an airport in San Francisco, a woman uh, who was a pilot approached a United Airlines um, 
person, uh, representative and said, you know what, I have a pitch for you. Women would make much better um, stewards, stewardesses, uh, nurses, in fact, should hire us because um, we, will, we will know what to do with air sick passengers and women are naturally nurturing. Um, so that's kind of the pitch that she made, Never mind the, the vaguely you know, gender essentialist argument that was being made back then. We'll leave that to the, <laughs> to the side. Um, but uh, the guy bought it and pretty soon across the whole industry, it was women. And now in the 60s, um, it became ex- completely women um, because women offered a, a, a lure that men could not offer uh, to businessmen who were primarily the passengers on flights in those days um, by, you know, their mere sexiness and their sex appeal. So, one the, um, yeah. One so of the things it, you, yeah, well, one of the things you say in the book um, was that being a flight attendant was a vehicle to providing a more stimulating life than was available to women at the time. Um, so talk about why women were signing up um, and, um, you know, what they'd hoped to get out of this career. It totally did offer a more stimulating um, life than they could find in other acceptably feminine um, roles like secretary or teacher. Um, the, the fact is that prior to the 1960s, um, it really wasn't socially acceptable for women to travel on our own. Um, and even in the 1960s, it wasn't very socially acceptable for a woman to just up and do a backpacking trip if she wanted to. They didn't have the kind of freedoms that we, um, that we have today. So for a woman who really didn't feel comfortable um, being kind of as much of a, you know, shoving off that yoke of um, societal disapproval that she would have had to do, uh, she, she could just sign up and be a stewardess. And then everyone approved of the job. It was glamorous. It was um, acceptably feminine, but it also offered access to, to tons of different geographies. You say they were unintentionally in the thick of the culture wars. Um, where was feminism in the, during the jet age? Baking from our childhood just sticks in the memory, doesn't it? We never set off on holiday without piles of Tupperware. And there'd always be Bakewell slice, flapjacks and tray baked scones in the boot. Do you not do that, Lisa? No. no. (laughs) Sadly, I do not stack uh, the Tupperware in the back of the car when we go off on holiday. Welcome to Small Ways to Live Well, a new podcast from The Simple Things magazine. Season two is a pick-me-up tonic that helps us make the shift from winter to spring. A six-week suggestion box full of things to note, notice and enjoy about the season. Search for Small Ways to Live Well on your podcast app. Feminism was starting to, to get its, um, its full propulsion. Um, women were certainly doing a lot of, um, sorry, so let me start over. (laughs) That's good. We're good. Feminism was starting to really come into its own in the 60s on some level, second wave feminism that is. Um, So women were going to school, to colleges, women were um, starting to, you know, do things like go to law school, become doctors. um, And, you know, the, the, um, the average age of marriage was starting to go up in the late 60s. But um, in the early 60s, the the 60s really was the era that changed um, so much for the way that women lived in the world. At the beginning of the 60s, uh, marriage was a near complete norm. By the end of the decade, it was very different. Um, So the 60s saw a lot of changes. And the fact is that stewardesses were part of those changes without really realizing how much they were. But um, the, the job itself offered women um, so much of this freedom that then that freedom wound up unschooling across other venues, right? It, it wound up impacting their marriages. They didn't get married um, until much later in their lives um, than at the beginning of the decade they had. Um, it impacted their financial independence. They were getting paid um, and therefore they needed bank accounts and they needed, <laughs> they wanted credit cards, which wouldn't be legal until the early seventies. Um, so, you know, all of these different changes that wound up um, kind of creating and working together to propel the feminist movement, um, the second wave of the feminist movement, it was, it was all working together. One of the interesting things that um, I found in your book was that the, 
flight attendants, the stewardesses, to use the antiquated term, but the flight attendants slash stewardesses were um, facing sexism both from the passengers on their plane and from the company they were working for itself. And so some of the things that they were saying, I mean, I can read a couple of them here. Um, Pan Am would say, our first run movies are so interesting. We hope you're not missing the other attractions on board. Um, they well, so had that the, was actually a slight correction. That was actually not Pan Am. That oh, was, really? Oh. That was Continental. I should have read more um, carefully. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but flight attendants were facing that at least. Absolutely. Flight attendants um, across all airlines were certainly facing a perception that they were, you know, but the, the sexism um, uh, that the corporations wanted to push on them because they knew that, you know, by, by promising sexy stewardesses, they could get a bigger market share. Um, and then the way that that impacted the passengers, the passengers really, men felt entitled to, 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 perceive the women in that way. But so talk about, there's, there's a couple other quotes from the book. Um, Nothing pleases people more than female people. And then the fly me campaign, the not, yeah. the not so veiled or maybe purposely out front way of being sexist and talking about women's sexuality in an advertising campaign. Definitely purposeful, 100% purposeful. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Talk, talk about the campaign and how overt it was yeah. and what they were trying to say. So at the end of the 60s, uh, basically the airlines realized that by, you know, by sexualizing its stewardesses, uh, they, could, uh, they could get this bigger market share of the primarily male passengers on planes. And now um, there's a distinction to be made between Pan Am and other air, American domestic airlines because, you know, uh, keep, Keep in mind that in the late 60s, the sexual revolution was happening in the U.S. It was not necessarily happening in all of the places that Pan Am flew to. So, you know, um, the miniskirt that uh, PSA Airlines had at stewardesses wear, for example, would not read the same way um, in New York, L.A., Paris, as it would in New Delhi or, um, you know, or Jakarta. So Pan Am was always a, uh, the more, on the more conservative side. Um, but that uh, that nothing pleases people more than female people quote, it was certainly from Pan Am's CEO. <laughs> so, you know, even even Pan Am sexualized its women in in different ways, perhaps not not as overtly, um, yeah. but um, a huge part of the, the the corporate culture back then. So, what was life like for them on the road? Um, was it a party filled romp? I mean, well, let's let's go back. When, we, when, we t when I talk to flight attendants today, they tell me about the long hours and they tell me they've got four or five flights in one day or even six and they fly for two or three days and then they're back in their home um, for a couple more days and then they go back out. Um, and it's a lot of work and they, you know, they, they look at you if you, if you have a, a moment with them that's you know, relatively um, you know, kind of covert, they'll tell you, boy, I'm tired. You know, it's long, long few days. What was life like for a flight attendant back then? Was it uh, the party-filled romp? Did it match the male fantasies that Pan Am was trying to evoke? Look, to some extent, you kind of can't you, you can't say that every steward has had the same experience of the airline. Right. To some extent, there were definitely women who who partied a lot, and there were definitely women who really embraced the new sexual freedom in a way that I think is really admirable. Good for them, right? Cheers. Um, there were also women who were who didn't embrace that freedom because they didn't necessarily want it. And that's part of what feminism is. It's the ability to either to, to choose how you want to, how you want to behave. Um, so everyone was exhausted to some extent. Uh, the, the, the flight patterns were certainly tiring. Yes. And it was, it was hard work. They were on their feet for many, many, many hours in a row. And then they were jet lagged because they were flying these huge lateral swaths of the world rather than up and down, right? So they were in different time zones all the time. Um, they, were, they were definitely tired, but it was also very fun from every story I've heard. Um, it was, you know, there were a lot of different things that women could, could love about the job. Um, I had one source who, just wanted to see every monument and she loved visiting um you know the Taj Mahal she went to Biblos she went to all of these different places um and she loved she loved seeing feeling the different textures of places so she didn't party as much but she definitely loved being a tourist in places and then talking to people on the ground everywhere she went um I had another source who loved the nightlife she loved to dance and she um would go to these 
to nightclubs in the different places where she went visited and so you know she's telling me stories about these different nightclubs and god i was jealous certainly <laughs> it sounded awesome um yeah. dancing to these different local types of music um amazing right so uh yeah there, there was time for fun um there are several sweet and poignant moments in the book as well um one of them is when the moon landing happens describe how the flight attendants got the news and how the people on the planes got the news and um why also that they said that this particular feat of flying was so inspirational to them they found so a, a lot of the different the different women found it poignant for different reasons again one of them found it incredible because um she felt like it was it was accessible to her you know she was in the same kind of um place if you will as the astronauts were she she was going up into the air also um so that was it, it hit a personal tone for her that uh, it wouldn't have had for someone who was more um, firmly based on the ground um another woman found it incredible because it was um it was a human it gave her a sense of human unity, you know, and it kind of confirmed this instinct that flying had started to give her that um, people around the world were more alike than they were different. Um, and so the sense, it, it gave her a real sense of, you know, a pinnacle of human achievement. Um, and then, you know, it, it, it was a, it was a real moment. Hmm. Um, how did the women you spoke, you spoke to, um, view their careers um, as they were moving forward in life? Did they see this as a stepping stone to another career, to a future, doing something else? Or did they plan on getting into this and for 30 years, I'm going to be a flight attendant? So for the most part, they really thought of it as a, a temporary thing. The people who signed up, at least in the 60s, did. And part of that was because um, it was, you know, structurally a, a temporary thing. Back in the in the '60s, women were forced to retire either in their 30s or when they got married, um, and that was not, you know, they didn't necessarily do that. <laughs> there was an estimate that um, at that point in time, 30 to 40 percent of stewardesses had secret marriages. They just didn't tell management about. Um, and also pregnancies too, right? Definitely, yeah, for sure. Women hid their pregnancies. They were technically supposed to retire if they got pregnant, um, and they wanted to keep flying, keep getting a paycheck. I mean, when else do you need money? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, they wanted to keep getting a paycheck until they couldn't hide the pregnancy, uh, which was expressly not allowed. Um, so you know, it, it, they most women thought of it as temporary because it was meant to be temporary. But then once they started flying, a great many of them no longer wanted it to be temporary. They, they really enjoyed their jobs and they certainly didn't want to be told when they would have to quit, even if it wasn't going to be a lifetime vacation. They didn't want to be told that they had to quit when they got married. They wanted to decide that they wanted to quit five years into being married. Fine, great, cheers. So these were the women who um, wound up pioneering a number of the EEOC's first lawsuits about gender discrimination. How was, and we are going to talk about the legal aspects of this and how the pillars of the industry wind up kind of crumbling away as the legal fights move forward. But um, how was the industry and the occupation seen from the outside? If you told somebody you're a flight attendant, um, because it was so gendered and because the advertising was the way it was, how did, let's say, your mother or your grandmother or your, uh, you know, your friends back home, how did, how would, did they view that profession? So nearly unilaterally, the mothers of all of the women that I interviewed were so disappointed when their daughters wanted to be flight attendants. They they had they felt great pride in the fact that they had sent their daughters to college, um, and they, these were these. You have to keep keep in mind that on Pan Am, the requirements for becoming a stewardess were were really rigorous. You had to have some college education at least. At some point, it was a college degree was required, um, but not for very long. Um, they had to have regardless they had to have some college education they had to speak two languages um and all of that on top of all of the aesthetic super sexist requirements around height and weight and um appearance so these were women who and and in that era only something like seven percent of american women graduated from college so this was not these were you know the best and brightest on some level um and and you know the the 
kind of the reputation for stewardesses for being, um, for lack of a better word, kind of um, kind of loose women, uh, less moral. Um, the, their moms really bought into this, and they were they tended to be um, even if they didn't buy into the sexualized aspect of it, they they were disappointed. They they said some version of, you know, we sent you to college for this to to serve someone on an airplane to be a glorified waitress, um, and yet these women. Their, you know, their peers may have seen it differently because stewardessing was such a sought after job. Um, it was, a, I think high school seniors um, rated it as the most sought after job among women um, in the late 60s. So it was a real generational gap um, in terms of the perception. What were other women doing, women who didn't become flight attendants? What was the career path like? It was starting to broaden certainly. Um, and it's hard to say that, you know, all women face these these choices, but for the most part, um, the acceptable jobs were nurse, secretary, teacher, or stewardess. So, um, you know, if you gave me those choices, I would certainly choose stewardess. <laughs> me too. Yeah, me too. Um, uh, uh, I want to ask about Vietnam because you mentioned earlier that um, one of the big things that the women would tell you about was flying into and out of war zones. Um, talk about the refugee flights, um, the emotional connection that these stewardesses have with the people of Vietnam, um, and how Pan Am gets intertwined with this unbelievably large personality that is the Vietnam War. Yeah, so the women didn't necessarily know that that this was going to be part of the job description. Um, out of California, so at first from 66 to 68, the, the contracts that the U.S. government signed with, the, uh, with Pan Am were fulfilled by a, a specific um, number of crews that lived in Hong Kong. So, you know, the, um, so the troops were given five-day R&R trips and Pan Am and a couple of other airlines. At, at first, it was just Pan Am that fulfilled that contract that flew the R&Rs. Um, and then after 68, due to the popularity of the program, um, the government started contracting with other airlines. In those first years, though, it was just very specific crews out of Hong Kong. Um, and then once the program got bigger, uh, they started contracting. Um, they th that that Hong Kong base was dissolved, and uh, they moved all the women back to, and the pilots um, to a bunch of different bases. And they started contracting the the war flights out of the West Coast bases, which were San Francisco and L.A. So that meant that all of a sudden, if you flew out of San Francisco or LA, you could um, get assigned a Vietnam War flight. And, you know, you could turn it down as a stewardess. You didn't, the airline couldn't force you to, to take those routes. Um, but that meant that you probably wouldn't be flying in Southeast Asia. Um, and for the women who, you know, <laughs> this is a group of women who were all united by their desire to see pretty much every corner of the world, very few said no. But some of the flights get really dangerous. I mean, yeah. th there are people being, you know, r refugees being loaded onto the planes and the stewardesses have to look after children. Yeah. Um, just describe some of these flights and what they were all going through. So some of the flights, the, the R&R flights were, um, were flying in and out of places like Da Nang, uh, where firefights happened, where, um, you know, the, the runways were subjected to a lot of mortar fire. Um, and sometimes a couple of those, the flights did see that, that those fire, fi firefights. Um, so women, not that many, but, but a number of women were um, in those really dangerous positions in, in the war. Um, even the women who were not necessarily in that kind of position, a lot of the women um, were in, uh, were at some point on a flight that had to take on refugees. Um, so those were, especially at the end of the war, um, increasing number of uh, refugees were being put on um, the airplanes just regularly to try to escape um, from Saigon. There was a lot of um, propaganda um, that was floating around South Vietnam about how um, brutal the North Vietnamese would be to those South Vietnamese who remained. So the airport became a real site of chaos. Um, and all of that culminated in um, a couple of really historic flights that one of them is the kind of um, in, in a central 
part of the last section of, of my book. Um, it's the flight that all three of the primary subjects of the book meet on. Um, it was one. Of, it was the first flight of Operation Baby Lift. Um, so, and that was a, a flight that was trying to meet um, uh, the the Gerald Ford's promise that he would try to get um, a number of uh, American half American, half Vietnamese war orphans um, out of Vietnam before um, Saigon fell to the North Vietnamese. And some of the women you talk to actually consider themselves, um, you know, I don't know if the word veteran is the right word, but they consider themselves having experienced combat. Absolutely. It's, 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 a, it's a strange, um, yeah, veteran's not the right word, certainly, but, but I don't know what the right word would be. And they yeah. certainly were never able to find the right word. Um, and, and, you know, especially because, you know, due to the glamour of their jobs, um, no one really kind of expressed an interest in hearing about this much more, um, or rather this very, very different um, side of their jobs. One of the quotes that stuck out at me is, um, I'm not a sex symbol. I'm someone who can open the door of a 747 upside down in the water and in the dark. Uh, that's pretty cool. Totally. These, I mean, for the most part, I think we forget. We, we, it's, it's interesting because we forget in both eras, in the 60s, 70s, and today, that flight attendants, stewardesses back then, flight attendants today, are primarily safety um, personnel. They're, they're there to keep us safe. And there are a lot of things that can go wrong in the air. There are a lot of really dangerous circumstances that can befall um, a plane. It could happen back then. It can happen today. And, um, you know, stewardesses were kind of seen as being these, you know, glamour pusses um, and really copy to your me, um, that terribly sexist book, which was actually written by a man and not written by two stewardesses. Um, it, it's a, a total document of male fantasy. Um, it, it really came to dominate the way that the American public thought about stewardesses in that era. Um, and today we, we kind of think about flight attendant t attendants as being these harried, um, you know, people who are just there to make our lives more comfortable in a way, you know, they're, they're there to field our complaints about, um, you know the small seats, or that we want more, more, <laughs> more. And the luggage or rules, peanuts. exactly. And all luggage rules, things, all of these yeah. different things. But the fact is that everyone's there. You know, the the flight attendants today are there to perform an incredibly important job, and still there are, are really a lot of things that can go wrong. Did any of the women you spoke to, or women of the day who worked for Pan Am, get to move up in the company? Was this yeah, ever a, a springboard? Yeah, a number of them did. Yeah, a number of them did. Yeah. One of my um, interview subjects was really, she was incredibly determined for, for over, for a decade and a half to get into management. Um, and, you know, when she started in the late 50s, that was absolutely not going to happen. Um, and then in the late 60s, uh, as women started uh, being hired onto different levels of management across many industries in many different ways in the, in the U.S., due in part to, you know, new labor legislation. Um, that was enabled by the EEOC and by the lawsuits that a number of women brought against various companies. Um, this woman that, that my book follows, Claire, did wind up getting a management job. Um, she at first was a supervisor and then she uh, trained other women into supervisory, other flight attendants, stewardesses into um, supervisory roles. So she, she really exemplified this um, movement of women from flight crew into management. The exclusivity of female flight attendants, or I guess of, of women to the flight attendant profession, is whittled away, as you're mentioning, um, as the legal and social pillars of society that kept it that way are, um, are knocked down. Yeah, I mean, the, at, at first, you know, it, it's, it's kind of excruciating to go through and read the documents from these lawsuits because um, the arguments that these lawyers uh, for the airlines make as to why exclusively um, really beautiful women, beautiful young women should be serving um, the passengers. It, it, it's, it's excruciating to read, especially as a, as a woman. Um, the, the airlines really wanted the women to, to stay young, beautiful, um, and female. Um, and as women got older, as, oh, and white, they, they wanted the women to be white in the um, early 60s. And, you know, as m different kinds of women wanted to work for the airlines as women who were older wanted to keep working for the airlines. They brought lawsuits against these like racist, sexist hiring policies and they won. 
How did Pan Am die? Um, Pan Am, it, Pan Amers will say that it was a, a casualty of deregulation, that in the um, 60s, uh, for, I mean, rather, until the um, late 70s, all airline um, prices were were fixed by the U.S. government. Um, they were a matter of uh, flight miles flown rather than, um, you know, an open marketplace that uh, a company could could compete with each other, um, that companies could compete with each other uh, via uh, prices. So once um, the deregulation happened and uh, competitive pricing became a thing, um, it really impacted the way that the airline industry happened. Uh, there was this really... The, the final flight of Pan Am was really emotional. And I didn't, I wouldn't have ever have expected myself to get, I don't know if teary eyed is the right word, but I got a little bit emotional reading about this final flight where they, they shoot the water cannons from the fire trucks over the plane as it goes through. And I've witnessed some of those as a reporter um, for different reasons, you know, usually not great ones, but this final flight of Pan Am was like really emotional. Like this airline is saying goodbye to the society that it served. And that was a symbol of that society. Totally. And, and it's a society that, that it helped to create and change. And, you know, um, when I, when you asked about Pan Am um, and it, its demise, I said, Pan Amers will say this. Um, yeah. What, what would I you say? Of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> in, in my research and granted, I'm not an industry expert. Um, I am, I'm, my, my book is not about, you know, the demise of Pan Am. So right. I, I'm very open to being corrected. Um, but uh I, the more I, I looked at it, the more I saw the 747, which was a plane that it was the world, the, the biggest plane. Um, it was a technical, another one of Pan Am's technical firsts. Um, and it, it hit the market in a time when, in a time of, of huge change and instability and a recession. And um, it was just, it was one step too far, one, one thing too big, one investment too profound for the airline to cover. And so from then on out, it was kind of the wheels started falling off the bus one by one. Um, is, there, is there a parallel industry for today's women? I don't know. And I would love to hear if you think there is. You know, I, in thinking about the advertising, so I live in Florida. In thinking about the advertising, I think about some of the chain restaurants that use women's bodies as a way of drawing people into the restaurant. Um, I don't want to mention any names, but there are actually a number of them and most of them are spinoffs from one really big name. Yeah. Um, but um, I thought of that and I was wondering if you would say that kind of industry. Um, the thing that I would say to that is that that doesn't promise a whole lot for the women. Yeah. Right. In return. Um, You're not you know, going to travel the world. No, exactly. You're not like the, the thing yeah. that I found fascinating about Pan Am in particular, um, to a larger extent, but all airlines really, um, was that, you know, it offered a really high degree of freedom, The the physical freedom is an important feminist issue, right? That the ability to move around the world freely to, to go to different places, um, to move through different geographies, it, it, it's very important. So, you know, Pan Am and other airlines, offered that freedom um, in exchange for this kind of rampant sexualization. <laughs> um, so it was a really, it was a, a it's a profound paradox. Um, is it a good I, thing I can't that think we, of anything. is it a good thing that we can't, I mean, I would assume it's, it's a good thing, right? That we can't totally. think of any obvious parallel industry. Yeah, for sure. And, and I, I think, yeah. I think, you know, sexualization and demeaning of, of women is certainly now much more, um, it's still a thing. Yeah, it's not like that's over. Right. <laughs> right. Right. It hasn't gone anywhere. It's just a lot more insidious these days and it's a lot more diffuse around a lot of different um, realms. Will flying ever be great? And you're not an industry expert. I get that. <laughs> but I need to ask you've written a whole book about planes um, and women. Will flying ever be grand again? I have no idea. And I wish I, I, wish I could say yes. You know, um, I, it, a couple of the interviews that I've done for this book, people are asking me about glamour and, and um, glamour and travel in the present day. And it's interesting because um, 
I think if you'd asked me when I was traveling much more frequently, not, you know, at the end of a pandemic, I just had a couple of kids also. So, you know, I'm, I'm, my life has changed drastically. Yeah. You can't travel um, anywhere anyway. I, I, even if exactly. You to. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've been on, on plane. So right now, everything seems glamorous to me. But, um, you know, even, even sitting, I, I, I was talking with a friend the other day about how much money I would give just to sit vaguely jet lagged in an airport in a foreign country and sip a glass of wine or a beer or something by myself like waiting for a plane delay <laughs> like it, the it, term it vaguely jet lagged is a good one i like that term vaguely <laughs> jet lagged i feel like i'm jet lagged it's, it's around there somewhere um uh you know i i've been to I, I mean i grew up at laguardia airport that was my main airport leaving as a kid from the bronx and uh, of new york um, and it was pretty rough for a long, long time. It was not mm -hmm. a great airport and it really has gotten better. And so when I think about will flying ever be grand again, I walk into that new terminal, which is where Southwest now leads from and gets down to Tampa really easily. And it's actually pretty nice. And I think to myself, maybe this is the sign of an acknowledgement by these companies that we'd like to be a little bit more, not perfect, but a little bit more comfortable. Yeah, well, and if you go to, there are, you know, um, the Swiss airports, the airports in Switzerland are beautiful, right? There, other countries have, have um, you know, a higher level of investment in infrastructure and in um, airports themselves. Our, our model is not necessarily what other uh, countries have as a model, the flag carrier model and the, the um, nationalized air travel model is very different from our, um, you know, what, what we do here. So I don't know whether it'll, it'll ever be grand and glamorous here in the U.S. again, but um, there certainly is glamour to be found in the airline industry. Um, it's just not on U.S. airlines. Sorry. It's just not here. It's just it's not, not here. here in the nicest way possible. <laughs> no. um, uh, I want to end with this quote and you can reflect on it. Um, it was a great quote. It might've been the last thing before your epilogue. Um, stewardesses are always one step ahead. You say that they're um, anticipating movements, making movements happen, creating a force felt on the ground below. What made you write that line? Um, throughout, over the course of, of the book, um, I was shocked by how these women seem to have anticipated so many different aspects of American culture. To me, um, one of the first things that, that shocked me about them and that I found so intriguing was the way that these women that I had met uh, seemed to be third wave feminists who existed um, as the second wave was happening. They, they made the changes of the second wave happen in a lot of ways, and yet they were third wave feminists. They wore lipstick, they got manicures, they, they liked clothes. Um, a lot of them also wore hiking boots and, and um, you know, chose to, to, to be who they wanted to be, but it was a much more free sense of feminism uh, that I felt from them. At the same time, you know, it was also superficial things like, you know, because they were traveling to and from Paris, they tended to wear uh, European fashions before American women did. Um, they, uh, they participated in, in global uh, war efforts and tensions before um, everyone else did. They, um, they shopped at different places around the world um, before the department store existed and could sell different things from different places around the world <laughs> in the same place. So really they seem to have anticipated a lot of these different movements that today uh, we kind of take for granted like third wave feminism and like the globalized marketplace um, and like international diplomacy and interconnectedness. They were just living it in the 60s and 70s. Julia Cook, author of Come Fly the World, the Jet Age Story of the Women of Pan Am. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Evan. Certainly check out that book and also her previous book, The Other Side of Paradise, Life in the New Cuba. She's on Twitter at Julia C. Cook. Her website is juliacook.com. I do want to invite listeners to our Patreon page to ask for your support in keeping the show going. Go to patreon.com slash History. We're going to donate part of your contributions to a charity for children's literacy. And thank you for listening to Axelbank Reports History and Today, conversations with America's top nonfiction authors and why their books matter right now. Be sure to check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Axelbank History. We update those with clips from the show, guest announcements, and book recommendations. We'll see you next time. Thanks.